In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zwijger livecast. Good morning, everybody. Good morning or good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are. We are really, really happy that you came to join us at the livecast at Pakhuis de Zwijger, together with uh, Salto, together on Facebook or through Arkham uh, at Architecture Now. It's a, a series of talks that we started already in uh, 2017. And today we have arrived at the 24th edition already. Architecture Now is a show that stages the architect and all kinds of topical design issues. And now we are at the last part, the last edition edition of a trilogy called The Architecture and the Computer. And the first edition, uh, we talked about the history of, the, of uh, the computer, which actually took us back to the 1960s, where the, the computer wasn't much more than a calculator. And then it became a design tool or like a drawing machine. And then it became a storyteller until it evolved to what is now uh, an interactive medium that you can use in all sorts of ways. We did it with Teresa van Kenel. He co-curated uh, the exhibition in Munich, which is still on show, although two weeks back, we couldn't visit it because of the COVID situation, but maybe as in the Netherlands Museum already opening again, maybe it's possible to go there now if you are in Germany, of course. The second edition uh, we did together with Sander van der Burg and MVRDV and Lars van Vianen van Scape uh, Agency. And then we talked about data and uh, parametrics and how they shape the design, how you can uh, um, uh, design shapes, but also calculate spaces. And that actually took us from Gaudi uh, all the way to designing whole neighborhoods. And today we have arrived at the last edition, which is called the physical impact of data. Because uh, the, 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 all the, the, the digital tools and information that we have is not only a way to design uh, cities or buildings, but it's also something that takes up quite a lot of space itself in the form of data centers, satellites, uh, cables underneath the sea. So uh, today we are going to have a closer look on how that looks. And we are doing this with Paul Cornet and uh, Negar Sanan Bensi. And they are both here with me at the studio. Welcome, Paul. Welcome, Negar. Uh, Paul Cornet is the architect at OMA AMO uh, since 2010. Uh, also a teacher at Delft, and now he, you work mostly with AMO on uh, the think tank that is connected to OMA. And at uh, the TU Delft, he leads the research and design studio Data Polis, uh, on which research, actually, a book will be published in the fall of 2021. On my other side is Negar Sanan Bensi, uh, also an architect, graduated in Tehran, uh, but also worked at ZUS in Rotterdam, for example, and also lectures at the same studio at the TU Delft. Um, happy, uh, happy to have you here, both of you. And um, um, uh, you have prepared a, a, a presentation on how far your uh, research so far has uh, come. And uh, But before we dive deeper into the actual uh, effects and facts of the of your research what made you start this research Paul um, I think it came from an intuition honestly I think it came just from the intuition that uh, from technology that nowadays we use every day from our phones uh, laptops uh, connected devices uh, something so very intangible as data there would be actually something very physical behind it and therefore that would become um, interesting architectural questions so that was really that that trigger that, that started um, the, the whole the whole research, I would say. And the CEO Delft was immediately interested, gave you all the the means and the resources that you needed. Yeah, I think they they facilitated basically the kind of the start of the studio. But I think for us also it was a kind of path for exploration, you know, to kind of also see. We didn't expect that how much vast is the effect or the influence uh, on, of the data on, on our daily life and on, on our spaces, basically in different, let's say, scales. So um, so we also took this journey with the students, basically, to kind of explore that. So, so Paul, can you give us a, an, an idea of what exactly is the physical impact of data? What does it, what does it look like? 
Okay, so um, I mean, here, these are a few slides that we have developed with Negar and the students at UDelft um, that we will um, show you here with the pointer here. So we will start. I from think it's uh, your pointer that's working now, right? Yeah. I know, I, I have yeah, it. it works? Yeah. Okay. Um, we will start from a, a, an article that uh, we read a few years ago that was uh, stating that the world's most valuable resource is no longer, no longer oil, but data. And that big statement really triggered us in a world uh, defined by oil and, and the economy behind it. It was very like, uh, interesting for us to understand those mechanisms and what it would really mean. Um, we live today in a world uh, that is very physical, that we can comprehend. It's made of soil, water, uh, it's there, we have photos of it, so, so we can measure it and un understand it. But increasingly, over the last, I would say, years and decades, uh, there's been an increasing development of technology. Uh, here, this is a project that you can see that is a, a project by SpaceX to launch a few thousand satellites to provide an international and global bandwidth of internet that will allow us to um, have access to internet at any single time, any single location, regardless of political borders and time zones. Um, and it's something that, is f that we are designing as a new layer of the stratosphere uh, that is becoming more and more uh, present in our life. But in the same time, these mechanisms have allowed us to map certain things, such as climate change. So here, this is a satellite image where you will see the representation of the ozone hole. So this ozone hole is something that we have mapped today, but in the same time, it's a consequence of our actions on the planet. Um, and this is very interesting relationship between our impact on our planet, but in the same time, develop, being able to develop the tools that allow us to record and monitor uh, those changes. Um, we live in a very interesting time. Um, uh, a year ago, we found these articles that were stating that people spend almost 30% of their lives online. Uh, we are now in 2020, uh, in the middle of a pandemic that is affecting all of us. Um, and we therefore questioned that, uh, that, that article to understand with our students how much time they were spending today online. And when we made that survey with our students, we realized that we were not at one third, but we are now over 60% of our daily lives that is spent online. So basically from the moment that you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to sleep, you're basically spending your whole day online from working from home to watching music, reading books, uh, having cooking recipes, uh, seeing online, communicating with friends, working, etc. Um, and so was this something that is, was based on, on, on like general data or was it the experience of the students that they tested on themselves? That was the, stu the students themselves yeah. because we started uh, that semester specifically at the beginning of the pandemic. So we realized that actually the, we would never meet physically in our students, but we would have to do those courses online. Um, and, and, and we just realized that basically those students that were stuck at home and working from home, we're basically doing everything online. Um, and then you could extend also the fact that we are connected even when we sleep uh, these days. So that has a huge impact. And that means that also being online 24-7 uh, pretty much has, uh, has consequences um, on the spaces that uh, define it. Um, this is a world map of the uh, internet undersea cable. So the way we use internet, the way we communicate, the way we are online are actually made of hardcore wires that are crossing undersea uh, uh, spaces that are connecting land and allowing us at the speed of light to reach out uh, to each other. And those connections are made from something that are as tangible and as physical as copper wires, fiber optics, that are the tangible manifestations of uh, our connected world and our what we call the datapolis. So this is what's happening under sea. You see uh, natural life that is basically growing out of these uh, cables. Um, and when they arrive on land, these cables actually connect very typical buildings. So this is uh, what we call a series of those boring boxes. They are suburban typical uh, boxes that are uh, 
cable landing stations, IXPs, data center, distribution centers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that are the physical evidences of, of our connected world. Is any of those in the Netherlands or are they all from um, elsewhere? On those photos, uh, uh, probably those ones are, uh, it's, a quite, uh, it's actually quite interesting that you ask that question because it's a very international representation of the generic qualities of those buildings. Mm, But I suddenly, so. when you look at them more carefully, I don't think the, any of them is yeah, from the Netherlands. They, they could be anywhere, let's say, they, because they have such generic qualities that they could be uh, in the south of Africa, to in Asia, to uh, to center of Europe. But when you look at uh, all the typology of those kind of buildings, you realize that architecture can play a very interesting role. So here we are in Rotterdam. Uh, this is the Vanille factory, which used to be uh, uh, coffee and tea uh, manufacturing, that is now a listed UNESCO building. And a piece of that building is currently a data center. Uh, it's actually very good for the gaming industry, apparently. Um, so it allows to connect uh, Rotterdam and the Netherlands to like the European scale. Um, here we are in New York. So this is a, a skyscraper in downtown Manhattan, totally blind. That used to be a telecommunication company that has been recently turned into also a data center. Uh, these are experiments that Microsoft is doing in the south of France and also in Finland of uh, micro capsules that go underwater and that benefit from the cooling of the water uh, because those machines actually require a lot of energy to, to actually uh, being uh, oper operational. Um, and, and, and this is happening actually under the sea. Here we're back in the Netherlands. Uh, we're in the north of Amsterdam in Agriport 7, uh, where you have Microsoft that has invested uh, billions, of, uh, billions of euros in their uh, latest data center. But what's interesting here is that they are uh, first using energy such as windmill and solar cells to, 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 to compensate the energy of the data center. And the excess of energy is actually used by the greenhouses located on the other side of the road, which are growing paprikas and they are benefiting from our data energy, excess energy, to actually grow food for the Dutch market. Um, so it's a kind of interesting way that somehow these boring boxes are interacting more and more with the surroundings. So uh, up until this point uh, in, in, in your story, we haven't seen one single human soul. No. What's the effect of that? On yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's indeed a, a good point because uh, this is another one, for instance, in the North, uh, uh, North Arctic where they're trying to make the greenest data center. But indeed, all these boxes, once you get inside, there are spaces that look like this. So this is here we are inside Google. Uh, here we are inside Tesla, so we are inside in Reno, in uh, somewhere in the middle of the desert. Uh, here we are in Amazon distribution centers. So the day you click and you buy something online, you're actually suddenly uh, enacting a process happening in one of these buildings. Here, this is very interesting. This is a <coughs> Russian entrepreneur that has developed a prototype of uh, micro housing where you can buy a house and next to your house you have a Bitcoin mining factory that is generating heat to heat your house but in the same time generating profit out of your uh, Bitcoin uh, mining system. Uh, this, we are back in Rotterdam, this is a floating farm so it's a farm without any farmers where cows are basically, uh, uh, how to say that, taken care of by machines and the uh, milk is harvested as well by machine. And when you look at uh, Ocado, also a system in the UK that is uh, 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 dispatching uh, online retailing products. So when you see the level of efficiency, the level of engineering that is defined by uh, protocols, algorithm, uh, to be sure to be as efficient as possible and as uh, direct as you can be. So what, um, what is it that we're looking at? Is it, is it objects moving? Or? These, are, these are robots. So every okay. single little uh, green or blue or orange square is actually one of these uh, robots that you see on that image. So it's a grid uh, yeah. that is indeed where you see the ceiling height. The ceiling is basically defined by the height of the robot. And what mm -hmm. is striking to us uh, is when I look at all these spaces, in none of these images, you see a person. And that means that us as architects, we are increasingly, with the uh, exponential increase of data, designing buildings where the core user will not be humans anymore, but they will indeed be robots, objects, machines uh, that are driven by software engineers um, that are basically producing a type of architecture that will obviously become very different than uh, what we've been seeing until today where the core user were actually humans. Um, so that was very interesting. Uh, 
a kind of interesting fact is that I usually used to present these images saying, well, actually, there's still some uh, fields where this is not true. So if we look at creative industry, for instance, uh, such as architecture firms, between the 60s and pretty much 2018, <laughs> there's no much difference. You still need people that work inside buildings. But since February, actually, um, this is a photo of our office uh, at OMA, where all of us have been sent to work from home. And actually, that, that truth that I thought uh, uh, ethereal in a way that would persist forever is actually questioned by the pandemic today, where the office is essentially used as a kind of data center, where we are connected from home to our, those computers to be able to access the servers. But physically, we don't even need those spaces anymore. Uh, so even the, the spaces that we took for granted as being essential to our daily life are actually in a, in a situation of pandemic question uh, by, uh, by those um, facilities that are placed by uh, data and, 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 and being able to connect with each other. Um, so yeah, that's the second point I think of the... Yeah, of the, yeah. So, so anything changes in the world except for the architectural office. <laughs> <laughs> Negar, and um, what are the consequences of all all, all, all these? What, uh, you, you've done this, this the, the, the initial stages of, of research, yeah. and then what happened then? Yeah, I think uh, just to kind of continue from uh, what uh, Paul was uh, basically um, uh, kind of talking about, uh, I think uh, I think we see we can see the kind of consequence of of, of uh, the the data in very different levels. I mean, from the kind of uh, uh, scale of our bodies, basically, all the way to the scale of the larger territories, and this is also what we are trying to kind of investigate, uh, basically, within the context of the of the studio that we are doing in Tio Delft, mm. also within the context of the book that hopefully you will proceed and will come out soon. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 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 when you state that 90% of the world's data has been created in the last two years. I would think immediately of, uh, of photos or texts or uh, all kinds of messages and, and, and e emails or something, uh, uh, documents going back and forth. Or is it a different type of data as well? Is it also things that we produce by moving, by creating systems? I think systems? everything. I mean, even like, you know, for example, even like the sensors that we are using in the kind of domestic houses uh, the context, I mean, they are kind of producing and they need a lot of infrastructure and they also producing a lot of energy uh, uh, that you know all this everything that is connected basically through devices or um, I mean our connection with with the different let's say platforms it's connect it's related to this uh, production of uh, amount of data basically yeah. yeah so now we have arrived at a situation that we create 90 percent of the data which results in huge buildings that are no longer on a on a human scale yeah yeah, and also I think that's one thing, but also at the same time there is a it creates a lot of inequality at the same time. So we just think it's a normal situation that we are connected, but actually this is not the case for all the world. So it it, it has a very kind of uh, kind of complex system of let's say how to manage who is owning the data, you know, who is owning this infrastructure, which countries they have access actually to that. So there is a kind of large inequality in the sense of access to information and data, which is also fascinating basically to kind of know. And did you take that as a as a starting point for further research? Do you, yes. Did you bring examples or images of yeah, that? Yeah, I think I will uh, kind of try to a bit reflect on that later. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. okay. But do you have more images at this point? Yeah, or? I think Paul is... Uh, Should we move continue? on directly to yeah. that? Oh, that is good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, th I thought you would want to do this. Okay. Yeah. Um, so basically, I think... Uh, oh, you're going to click. <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, for us, basically, as, as also within the kind of, uh, let's say, context of the university, what was a kind of issue was not only the whole, the kind of topic of the data, but also the way how to actually study that, right? So, mm -hmm. because it is still, it is a very, very much kind of engineering problem, it's a kind of technological problem. So, uh, it's also a question how architects can kind of question or access, basically, this topic. I, I really like this quote from uh, Keller Sterling. She's a well-known writer and academic uh, 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 theorician. Um, she, she basically writes, buildings are often no longer singularly crafted in enclosures, uniquely imagined by an architect, but reproducible products set within similar urban arrangements. As repeatable phenomena engineered around logistics and the bottom line, they constitute an infrastructural technology with elaborate routines and schedule for organizing uh, consumptions. So what she's kind of suggesting basically that as architect, we used to kind of think about object form or static form, 
But what we have to do is actually to start thinking about active forms. So all the dispositions or agents or let's say factors, forces which are actually kind of forming the, all these infrastructure spaces. Um, so within the studio, we also try to kind of follow these two trajectories, go back, going back to your question. One is basically simply to kind of try to understand what is the cloud, what is the infrastructure behind internet, you know, from the kind of larger, let's say, uh, understanding of the system, but also objects, building devices, um, which we call them as things. And uh, the second trajectory is basically to kind of uh, understand this agency. I mean, again, uh, kind of going back to your question, you know, like who is owning the data, what kind of effects they have on our life. I mean, uh, also uh, basically, uh, also how they facilitate new ways of living, right? For example, considering this kind of condition that we have right now, I mean, the only way that we can basically continue is through basically data infrastructures that we have. Otherwise, we couldn't live and work at the same time. I mean, uh, within this kind of condition of pandemic, everything would have been closed off, basically. So, I mean, I'll just go quickly through some of the examples of the students' work that we, we have been doing. I mean, um, uh, Keller, uh, uh, um, Kathy Veligov, she's also an architect and a researcher. She kind of calls or kind of suggests that we, ha we can th think about basically the kind of architecture of this infrastructure through relational mapping. What, what does it mean? Is, uh, basically, it means that we can, uh, let's say, uh, relational mapping is a way to kind of investigate uh, the, the, um, the ecosystem of relationships within the organization. So we are not only concerned with the kind of objects, but actually the kind of the relationships that they can make with each other, but also, um, you know, the kind of uh, the way that they are affected from other, uh, let's say, dispositions, basically. So, so it's about the design of systems instead of objects. Exactly, yeah. This is what we are really kind of having emphasis also, that we think about system, but also architecture of the, of the system. So this is, for example, showing the ecosystem of a data infrastructure. I mean, pull, I mean kind of quickly went through a different... Uh, let's say fragments of it, but uh, it shows basically f from the kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, this is a system with the kind of, of course, undersea uh, cable, uh, uh, kind of continental transportation, um, which when it arrives to the land, there are a lot of, let's say, different elements, like all the way from the beach manholes to the landing stations, to the data centers, IXPs, um, cellular towers, uh, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera, distribution centers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, all the way till arrive to our devices like mobile phone or sensors, uh, something like that. So this tries to kind of map the whole ecosystem of the infrastructure. This is in relation to the kind of uh, research that the students were doing in relation to logistic. So it shows basically uh, the kind of supply chain management from the moment of the uh, kind of production, basically. So. Uh, the, the start of the factory all the way where it arrives to the customers and it, it the kind of the kind of interrelation that it's making with the infrastructure of the internet so the kind of top shows the current condition of the system and the bottom is in the kind of future let's say condition when there would be further the uh, kind of involvement of of the big data in the whole logistics system so, so how do i read this 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 diagram so basically you kind of start at the left from the, uh, and, uh, from the kind of factory basically. Yeah. And then it goes all the way through different parts of the whole supply chain management, all the way to the customer at the right. And also at the top you have different, let's say, let's say elements or even invisible or visible, let's say, uh, uh, infrastructure of the internet involved within that system. Okay. Yeah. And this is also a kind of ecosystem of basically kind of decentralized uh, we, we, she calls it the student, uh, Sandra Bacherman calls it the person focused, let's say, care system. So, uh, as uh, in the moment that actually uh, the kind of uh, the notion of data is very much involved within the whole uh, kind of structure of the healthcare system. You know, I mean, right now, for example, a lot of hospitals, that they, especially the ones that they are including the research centers, they have their own data centers, actually. So, it's fascinating to see that, uh, like, the kind of the, the part which is related to services and hospital is actually growing compared to, for example, the parts that are taking care of the patients. So she's trying to map all the different elements basically that uh, are involved or it can be kind of, uh, let's say, develop with the idea of the further involvement of the data uh, in the healthcare system as a large. And also we study the architecture of the things also, you also kind of refer to that this is a, a Walmart distribution center layout and carefully kind of drawn and uh, yeah, kind of, you see again the same thing, you know, there is no human. I mean, everything is related to the dimension of 
of the machines or cars or like different devices basically which are in it and also it's of course always that the, the point is the maximum optimization of the whole system this is about one of the greenhouses in netherlands basically that uh, they also have very separate spaces where basically the human can access where basically uh, the machine can access for the kind of taking care of the of the plants etc and uh, this also then leads us to the fact that uh, we can basically create a kind of catalog of different let's say, architectural elements, but also devices, you know, that uh, they are basically um, are the main points that architecture starts, not the human scale, but other, other, other devices as such. For example, this one was the kind of uh, mapping that the students did from the, the kind of architecture of the uh, factory. So, 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 what what are the consequences of, of all that for the architectural profession? Um, well, I think uh, what is fascinating is the way that we are actually looking into the problem of architecture. You know, so I think uh, one of the main things that we kind of realize more and more we cannot see architecture as a kind of a, a isolated problem. Just thinking about solving the kind of immediate context, or let's say uh, solving the kind of the problem of the building itself. So I think one of the, let's say, challenges is that we need to kind of, lo kind of look at this larger, basically, system, the ecosystem of, let's say, factors, forces, agents, which are involved, basically, in that process. And, and if you look closer at those facts, what, what kind of actions do you think should be taken from the point of view of, of the architect? Um, uh, basically, I, I mean, I, w I would say it first needs a kind of let's say total change of let's say approach uh, towards the act of design and uh, and also the kind of integration uh, um, of those factors into the design basically so um i mean if if we kind of yeah talk about the more kind of a specific example i think it would be more tangible i mean this is also because architects are not involved. For example, all these kind of boxes that I kind of Paul showed, you know, from the distribution centers or data centers, architects hardly are involved in the design of those. I mean, there are very few examples that we know that slowly yeah. are becoming architectural problem. I think that's the whole point indeed, that a lot of these are so in a way technical that they have been left in the hands of engineers. And therefore the architects are very so far I've been very little involved in those questions because it's a very new, uh, let's say, uh, question on architectural uh, thinking, you know. Uh, um, so there's a kind of ur urgency for architects to understand the physical impact of those infrastructures, to try to understand them as not isolated object, as Negar was saying, but part of a larger network of things. Um, and one thing that's for us also appeared just uh, extremely clear is that um, the way we use technology, that we think at the cloud as an immaterial cloud, something that we don't really have, you know, when we send photos or messages online, we don't really know how those things actually are stored or exchanged. They have a very clear physical impact on our planet. Yeah. And that in a day and in a moment where we are growing an awareness on climate change, on questions of ecosystems, of natural impact of the of the human footprint, uh, it's very clear that we as architects have to take a role in uh, being leading uh, discussions and leading an example in 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 changing those mechanisms to 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 make the way we use technology more sustainable. Uh, yeah, it, it's interesting to see all these diagrams of, of, of systems because uh, you can see there is no human inside, but there's also no human involved in the design of things. Mm. Who are actually the clients of those uh, data centers? Is, are it only companies or are there also governments, for yeah. example, that are the client to that? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, the, re the answer is that there's both. Uh, so in the Netherlands, actually, it's quite interesting because uh, we have vi been visiting the IXP of Amsterdam, which is an internet exchange point, which is actually uh, partially public owned and which is shared between different uh, shareholders. So actually, that's a let's say, let's call that the public system, where mm -hmm. the, the benefit of the large is, is the center of the activities and allows the, an IXP is basically a, a center of the web that allows to connect different data centers and, and internet for everybody. Mm -hmm. But uh, increasingly, uh, you have a very few, very little big tech companies that we all know, you know, you have Facebook, Google, Microsoft, etc., that have become so powerful that they are themselves building pieces of that infrastructure. So for instance, if you take 
uh, one of them, they will make sure that they build the cables, they build the data centers, they build the satellites, mm. that when you, you make a search on Google, you only use that infrastructure. And that means they are centralizing mm. completely the information and they are setting the rules for those information. So yeah. that, that starts also to question privacy, storage of data, mm -hmm. Uh, what it means that when you're, you know, having a photo online on your social profile, yeah. whatever platform it is, who actually owns that information, uh, who has access to it, uh, do you have any right to say, or do we actually, those companies are benefiting from, from what we call the big data, so the collection of large amount of information to uh, anticipate the way we behave online. Um, There's multiple amount of questions that are raising from all of that, and, uh, and I think... What we are trying to aim is to have uh, to open the discussion on the, on those things, so there is more transparency also in the way we use them, those platforms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then privacy is, is is let's say the next step after uh, studying all these systems. Uh, Negar, you you mentioned uh, uh, Keller Easterling, uh, uh, who is indeed indeed very. Um, uh, let's say, uh, 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 avant-garde in the way she is researching these systems. The Extra Statecraft uh, book is uh, explaining how these these mega structures are above national regulations or uh, European or uh, uh, continental regula uh, regulations and are becoming kind of a system on their own. Yeah. So then, then we have the the situation that we have data that are kind of forming themselves without any control, leading to buildings with our which are kind of processes where are no um, uh, uh, possibilities to to control them. Uh, going on until whole structures, whole central business districts that are above national or uh, uh, continental regulation. Yeah. Was that uh, how in your research um, did you find a way or did you find a way to make it a, a, a design issue again? Yeah, um, maybe I can kind of go on um, a little bit, uh, maybe uh, just to kind of refer to one of the examples. I mean, what I was trying to also say before is that what we are kind of suggesting, also we are trying to kind of achieve with the students, how is it possible to think within the system of relationships at the same time, kind of think about, let's say, the architecture of the things within that system. For example, this is a kind of a, um, a kind of proposal for the decentralized human care, uh, human-centered basic kind of uh, healthcare system. Um, I mean, the, the the whole diagram is a kind of showing a kind of nonlinear, let's say, relationship between different parts of the healthcare system, from the scale of the city all the way to different elements. You know, when when there is a kind of sick person, so the the person is kind of recognized with the certain sensors that is sick, all the way to how it kind of arrives to the moment that actually has to go to kind of hospital and what is the kind of components of hospital. Um, so it, but also involves basically, for example, the the way that the insurance companies. Um, they are involved within the system. So the whole, again, uh, issue with the kind of, uh, uh, let's say, a kind of privacy of the data, which is like a lot of insurers, basically companies they have access to and they use it for commercial use, actually. Um, uh, and also the, the kind of amount of, let's say, uh, let's say waste that the hospitals have, which is actually one of the highest within the kind of building typologies in the cities, they have very high amount of waste. This basic diagram is trying to kind of, let's say, combine all those together. So at the same time that when she kind of focus on the different parts, she's trying to, th to kind of think architecturally about where the patient has to be taken care of, you know, from the, uh, or do, do a surgery or different parts of the hospital, but also she's trying to kind of combine the different agents at the different stages that actually are involved with that. So what we're looking at here is an interrelational map, not like a spatial map. Exactly. Mm. Yes. Exactly. Like a body. <laughs> like yeah, a body. it looks like a body actually, yeah. like a, like a robot somehow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, bef before we move on to a, a very specific uh, uh, project of, uh, of of two of your students, uh, one question because it, it looks like we are kind of into kind of a gloomy perspective now. But you also mentioned that uh, the, the the heat that comes from all these uh, centers may also be used for different things. What are the good things that are coming from this development? I think the, the way that, you know, we are able actually to kind of work and live together <laughs> like, uh, at the same time, I think is one of the good things. Our, I mean, our daily conveniences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, in a way it's a luxury and we don't, uh, we don't, I mean, it's also fascinating how quick it becomes a kind of normality basically within our life. So, I mean, I think even, for example, universities now, they are kind of trying to develop a parallel, let's say, organization for online education, 
which was already before within the kind of agenda, but now it's 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 actually a very serious thing, you know, like it's, uh, so these are the possibilities and there are a lot of other possibilities, like the whole f understanding that we have from the kind of uh, climate change is thanks to this kind of technologies. I mean, the fact that what we are going to do with that, you know, this is kind of next question, are we acting or not? But there are a lot of things that are basically facilitated and facilitated and we know about them. So, um, yeah. So, so the good thing is that we know what danger is coming to us. Yeah, exactly. Yes. I mean, <laughs> but we're not quite sure how to solve it yet. Exactly. I mean, I think we are. I mean, we also don't know it totally. Like, I think. Uh, I mean, what you said at the beginning is very kind of correct in the sense that uh, the notion of data, or even uh, maybe I, I should call it digitalization, is um, in architecture main, mainly kind of addressed um, through the kind of uh, tools as a kind of way of doing the design. And not so much as a kind of topic or the way that it's kind of affecting actually the whole, let's say, wholesome of the whole life that we are living or environment that uh, we are basically acting within. So I think this is still, I mean, th there are a lot of uh, kind of things uh, going on right now, but I think it's, it's still things to be discovered or explored within that uh, theme. Yeah. Let's have a look at at, at, at one of the projects. Uh, uh, Paul, you, you already mentioned it earlier in your presentation. Uh, there is uh, this uh, claim on space uh, being used by all kinds of objects, satellites uh, that are connecting or uh, providing or sending out data. Um, we have two guests in Zoom, uh, Federica Longoni, uh, who came from the uh, university, uh, the university in, in, in Milan, Politecnico, and is now an architecture student at the TU Delft. Uh, and you were in, involved uh, in the data policy since March this year. And, uh, and, the, and, and our other guest is uh, uh, Philip Romaniuk, architect and coder, born in Poland, did his master's degree also in, in Delft, and is also the co-founder of Antirama, which is a collective that brings together architects, designers, creatives, uh, UX designers, uh, programmers, to, well, to, to, to get a grip on all these uh, uh, um, uh, developments that are going on at the moment. You did a project that's called From the Grave to the Cradle. So um, I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much for the, present, uh, for the presentation. Um, so we are uh, Federic and Philip, and uh, we would like to share with you tonight uh, our research and design project from the grave to the cradle. So what kind of data do we get from space? How do we use them? And what is the infrastructure behind them? Uh, this previous image uh, was taken by a satellite in 1966 uh, called the Lunar Orbiter 1. And uh, six years uh, later, only 50 years ago, this iconic picture presenting the whole Earth was taken. Later called the, the blue marble, uh, it constitutes one of the most interesting and important uh, achievement of space uh, exploration. And in regard to this image, one astronaut uh, once uh, said, when we originally went to the moon, our total focus uh, was on the moon. We weren't thinking about uh, looking back at the Earth, but now that we have done it, uh, that uh, may have been the most reason, important reason we went. So moving to... Um, this uh, perspective, this new perspective uh, given by this image, uh, we realized uh, a cognitive uh, shift in awareness uh, that has been called uh, the overview effect, which was making the astronauts realize uh, the fragility of our Earth uh, when seeing it uh, from space. Indeed, uh, our Earth is just a sphere uh, of a diameter of 12,000 kilometers, uh, but is uh, wrapped around a very thin, ultra-thin layer and the atmosphere, which is only 60 kilometers uh, thick. And in this uh, lies uh, its fragility. Later on, uh, satellites uh, capture many more blue marbles. Uh, but the whole Earth image uh, started an important uh, reflection of our impact uh, on the planet. And uh, for example, uh, but Mr. Fuller would state uh, that perceiving the Earth uh, as infinite uh, and uh, flat uh, was the root of, our, uh, of all our misbehavior. So when we saw it for the first time uh, as a sphere, we realized, that, for example, that uh, our garbage uh, wasn't going uh, uh, away, just the way disappearing, <coughs> but it just was, uh, it was going uh, somewhere else. Uh, and then uh, at a certain point, uh, it would have come back to us. Nowadays, uh, uh, satellites uh, collect uh, important data monitoring the climate. And for example, in this uh, slide, it's pictured the ozone layer with uh, the hole that we all know. 
And, uh, but satellites are only part, uh, one part of this bigger system. And the, from, the framework is completed uh, by antennas, launching station, and these are the traces of space infra infrastructure on uh, Earth. During the past years, uh, the launch of satellites uh, increased uh, dramatically, and uh, one emerging question is uh, what to do with the remains of these uh, satellites, uh, not anymore in use, but still orbiting around uh, our planet. Some of them are being sent back to Earth, burning, uh, to be burnt into the atmosphere, and some others are collected in some uh, graveyard orbits. But uh, the problem is that uh, this not, does not apply to all of them. Some are being uh, left uh, uncontrolled and untracked, uh, orbiting around with an incredible speed, between, uh, which is between 10,000 to 30,000 uh, kilometers per hour. And there are currently hundreds of millions of tiny objects uh, of space debris flying around our planet. For this reason, uh, we think of uh, drawing a parallel between uh, this uh, space junk and uh, the hyper object, which is uh, a term that, uh, coined by Timothy Morton to describe uh, objects that are massively distributed in space and time. So the problem is that uh, while uh, we are now aware of our impact uh, on Mother Earth, also thanks to the satellites. Uh, we did not realize that we were just offsetting our mode of consumption to space, uh, and that uh, since the space age started, uh, we enlarged our footprint uh, uh, to the cosmos, uh, moving from a condition of the Anthropocene to the one that we call the Anthropocosmos. So uh, we wanted to answer the question, how can we make the whole process of obtaining data from space sustainable? Can we obtain this data through a clean process, which will resemble the awareness gained so far, which was Federica talking about? Our project aims to imagine a post anthrocosmos a condition where the system of launching is composed of a zero waste total approach from energy to materials, from the ground to the space. Uh, the system is presented in the poster, as other students did, as in, and it's a section in which different layers of interventions are proposed. Within these layers, a range of elements are distributed. A solar plant positioned in outer space is the main source of energy powering the rocket through the microwaves. The same energy is also used to create the fuel of the rocket through the electrolysis of the water, obtaining the liquid hydrogen. Satellite debris at the bottom of the ocean are recovered and divided into their main materials. These materials constitute valuable resources at risk of depletion on planet Earth. Likewise, satellite debris in space are reassembled and made functional again through recycling space stations. Uh, the whole project is positioned in the Nemo point, uh, the farthest location from any living creatures where all uh, the bigger satellites are uh, be being originally sent back to Earth and are laying on the sea base of the Pacific Ocean. The project he presented in form of a model aims to transform what has been a spacecraft graveyard into the cradle of the new sustainable system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, 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 I was just getting used to, the, to the, the terminology of Anthropocene, and now I have to get used to Anthropocosmos, not only, it's even post-Anthropocosmos. <laughs> so I gather there are no humans in your project or involved in any kind of solutions or system that you are uh, designing, right? Well, um, the humans are designing those spaces, and uh, <laughs> we think that the most important uh, part of the of the story is that um, when design when we designed those uh, those elements, the satellites, and uh, we flew them uh, in space, we actually realized that all our problems, uh, climate change, uh, but also uh, satellitary images. Uh, uh, but then we missed uh, a step and we didn't realize uh, the further consumption that we were, um, we were causing. So in a way, uh, we are actors uh, of the change, uh, even though we are not living there, but uh, we constantly rely on this uh, infrastructure of data created by satellites. And also from 
the presentation that uh, Paul and Nagar gave to us, uh, there was this image of the new project of um, creating an, a net of satellites to give communication to the whole globe. So it's, uh, it's something that uh, we are constantly relating to. Uh, but then uh, we also need, it, need to think about this system sustainably. Thank you so much. Um, and Negar, Paul, what, what did this, uh, uh, this study or this project uh, teach you? What did you learn from it in, in terms of data police? Do you want to go ahead, Negar? You can <laughs> start. <laughs> um, well, I would say, I mean, <laughs> we, as I said at the beginning, we started from an intuition. So we didn't have pre-conception uh, of what we would find, actually. Um, but definitely the, the raise of awareness on, 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 on the climatic impact on, of all our actions, it's something that, uh, that, that, came, that came to me like, uh, you know, like uh, back, back to us uh, very strongly. So um, understanding also that any of our actions, as uh, simple as they can be from sending an email uh, to sending photos or answering a, a Zoom call, uh, uh, being with uh, online with uh, 30 students from 30 different countries during a semester, um, that that kind of uh, for me to at least it, it really opened my mind on like the the direct impact on every of our actions on on our mother earth and um, and that that brings a responsibility as architects. I'm, I mean we're doing that as a research studio, but I'm also a practitioner architect where we're building buildings, you know. Um, where the method of construction are still based on very modernist uh, traditions, let's say, which is concrete, steel, glass, plastic, um, and 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 that that means that that th those things have to change uh, simply because uh, the way we operate today are just not sustainable. We've been uh, uh, Negar earlier used the word luxury. I think we've been very lucky in the 20th century to uh, behave the way we've been behaving. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the 20, for the 21st century, we really have to change. So uh, we are today in 2020 in the middle of a pandemic that also raised, I think, a global awareness on a lot of things. Um, it just, uh, it's, it's really a kind of wake up call, I would call it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's almost too easy a question to let go, but it, if you're finding all these data and all these problematic uh, aspects of architecture in terms of climatic change and, and, and the negative uh, side effects of that, yeah. how does this, for example, reflect back on OMA as a company? Is there somehow that you are connected or connecting uh, to the practice of OMA yeah. itself? Yeah, I mean, we try, of course. Um, it's definitely something that, um, that is embedded in our daily work. And uh, so we, as OMA, build buildings, but with the AMO, we do research. So uh, recently we did this big exhibition on the countryside. Um, uh, I've been leading a, currently a research on materials. So starting to look uh, architecture, starting from the matière, so from what, what it's made of. And you realize that there's incredible amount of solutions that are actually uh, answering uh, those calls. Um, so it is definitely there. Then architecture is a practice that is uh, operated with not only designers, but we are working with clients, municipality, public clients, institution, etc. Um, so for things to change, actually, everybody has to agree and then move forward uh, on those questions, because otherwise, as architects, we will just be probably seen as idealists or close in our little bubble, but not have a real impact. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a global change that needs to, to happen. Yeah. And I think us as architects doing research and, and trying to raise awareness, um, we are in a good position to take a lead and be an example in those changes. But, um, but it, it, it won't be easy. It won't yeah. be easy, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, also, I mean, the other thing is that we were, I mean, when we also, we ourselves uh, kind of were educated, you know, we were educated in the different system. But I think uh, this whole kind of discussion about relational thinking, topological thinking, you know, like it, in a way it has to be integrated within the uh, all the disciplines. And also this kind of, let's say, um, uh, let's say division of the different disciplines, which is a kind of reflect on, on the industrial period. Uh, it is kind of it's a maximum specialization that kind of, uh, let's say, remove the conversation between the different disciplines it has to be also slowly again going back to fact that you know we have to talk to each other i mean this is very fascinating problem i mean even with the sometimes with the engineers uh, we cannot even agree on the terms mm -hmm. like yeah. you know like concepts that we say something and it means something and they say something i mean the same term means something else so 
I think it's it's a big challenge, but it has to be addressed at least uh, within the academia, hopefully within the practice uh, uh, as a consequence. Let's go back to the project of Federica and, and, and Philip, because it's, uh, 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 of, of, let's say, uh, apart from all the, the research that went with, it's so beautifully drawn. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to, to go back to the, to the image of the, the, the platform-like image, because what, what, what I liked about, the, about this study is that it also makes a very strong relationship to what happens in space and then what happens on Earth, in oceans, etc., is that uh, something that you could expand or uh, extrapolate into uh, bigger systems to solve, for example, uh, spatial waste or let's say waste in space, space junk? Well, I would say that's what they are intending for. I mean, it's uh, I mean, it's also kind of fascinating to see that. Uh, I mean, already this kind of Nemo point is the graveyard uh, of all this, uh, you know, satellites basically uh, dead satellites somehow. And I think uh, what is what is exactly is interesting is this, let's say, kind of long section from from there. So the the problem that already exists all the way to the space. So in a way, connecting those together. And I think uh, the the project is claiming for that, you know, to kind of at least addressing or let's say uh, hoping to kind of I, I would I won't say necessarily solving because it would be maybe too soon or too kind of uh, simple for that. But uh, at least addressing that possibility to. To connect things together, you know, or let's say to solve it somehow. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you, uh, Federica and Philip, for presenting this to us. W will this be something that you will be uh, looking into uh, further and 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 on a, on a deeper level, or are you moving on to the next aspect of data police after this project? Uh, in, in my case, maybe I would not develop the actual project further on, but I think that uh, in my case, in, in, in case of uh, every other uh, student who was a part of data police, it's changed the way we think about our built environment because uh, traditionally architects are like uh, thinking about an architecture as something very uh, rigid and in data policy we talk a lot about the social networks this kind of uh, uh, exchange of information and it's really like uh, makes us think about society which architects are kind of in charge of in some way too uh, in totally different and fresh way and i think more up to date thank you and and, and federica what was for you the, the biggest eye opener in uh, in this research um, I think what really interested me uh, in this research it was uh, how um, when we think about, for example, we had this topic of space and uh, when I thought about space, maybe also because of uh, the, let's say, luxury uh, century that we lived in uh, until now, uh, we think uh, immediately think about colonizing space. Uh, so going there to conquer other territories. Uh, while uh, this new perspective of data and uh, the image of the Earth uh, seen from space uh, gave us uh, a total new perspective. So we are not talking about the space uh, to colonize it, but we are talking about uh, going uh, to space uh, to look backwards uh, to our Earth and to understand better what uh, primarily we are doing and what is uh, our impact uh, on the way we live uh, uh, this Earth. And that was uh, very eye-opening for me discover. Thank you very much, both of you, for sharing your research with us. Thank you so much. And, and please stay along and join the conversation if you find a, 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 something that you would like to, 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 to jump into, into the conversation. Because I would like to, let's say, in the, the closing five minutes that we have left, to... Um, uh, well, to look at a longer perspective, because uh, uh, we will probably uh, produce more and more data if the last two years were only like 90%, it, that will expand hugely in the upcoming years, which will mean more buildings, more space being used up, uh, more uh, uh, waste of materials, more impact on Earth and on space. So uh, are you also looking for 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 um, that that kind of apocalyptic scenario that we have in front of us and, and, and where m possible solutions can be found? Yeah. I would say uh, in this case, it's usually very, it's easier actually to kind of, to be pessimistic basically about them. And what we are trying to do is, uh, I mean, of course, to be critical, but at the same time, try to see the possibilities. 
I mean, also saying that it's it's true that, of course, within the kind of development or uh, the increase of the, uh, let's say, production of data, of course, the technology is also developing, right? So they also, they also have a hand in a way to kind of, uh, let's say, uh, decrease hopefully the kind of the footprint or the effect that the data has. So it's it's not that only one goes out uh, or increases and the other one doesn't. So it, it's a kind of, let's say, a complex process in that sense. Um, but of course, we are we are trying to be very critical. We are, I mean, we are trying to also, again, and what I said, I mean, to see the very kind of different aspects of that, the political aspects. I mean, even like the way that the, the data is abused in certain countries, especially during the protests, you know, like very different aspects that the data basically um, can have on the, on the, let's say, different levels of the society. So we are trying to do both, to see the possibilities, but also to kind of, to have that, uh, let's say, apocalyptic <laughs> look to, to the future, yeah. But, and, and Paul, in, in, in your most optimistic moments, what do you think is the best that can come from this development? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah. how to say that? <laughs> uh, it's a big question. I mean, one thing that is quite interesting that we came across as well is that um, even though you know when we look at all these existing typology it looks a little bit old-fashioned to be honest there's actually a lot of research that is being done by scientists and research labs that are uh, you know give us a lot of hope on on, on possible solutions um, for instance just the way that data is stored it's it's based on a system of rack which is basically taking a lot of space and these racks you stack them to, together you make corridors you make buildings you make towers uh, but we discovered that for instance you have scientists that are just trying to rethink how we can store data um, so we found out for instance that some labs are developing a system of engraving into glass uh, where actually it's a kind of nanotechnology where you can just really compress to like thousands in terms of scale uh, the storage of data. Uh, we came across also examples of people storing data in inside water. So the question of energy consumption is totally reduced by the fact that it's basically dived in, 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 in inside the water and then therefore the footprint, the ecological footprint is totally diminished. Um, but those systems are today still at the fringes of the actual, uh, the actual uh, operation. So. Um, so there is different, definitely people that are leading, you know, uh, those kind of changes. Um, when we look at other industries, it's also possible, you know, uh, we all driving uh, petrol cars these days or diesel, but uh, electric cars are becoming more and more common, and hopefully will become more and more affordable. Uh, if we look at food, food systems, it's also the same. Uh, we've been used to uh, eat bananas that are coming from the other side of the planet, but uh, eating products that are actually locally sourced, it's also possible. Um, so th those mechanisms are, are, are definitely possible. Uh, but somehow it's also quite interesting as architects because architect is a very slow uh, profession. Uh, but sometimes you have to get inspired from uh, other fields uh, to understand that uh, changes can be made. Yeah, that, that would exactly be my next question because uh, it's, it's an interesting thought that maybe uh, uh, all those buildings, all those data storage will become smaller again. Yeah. So probably your next step is to find collaborations with scientists to see how uh, where where this is going and how this can be combined to well to the profession of architecture yeah yeah definitely yeah i mean we are slowly trying to kind of establish that also if possible bring it also to the kind of knowledge of the uh, let's say studio because of course our knowledge is also extremely limited i'm sure if we kind of talk to kind of scientists uh, yeah the, it seems too simple like uh, the way that we are kind of trying to deal with that. So that's definitely what we are yeah. looking forward to. So it. is that a type of collaboration within the TU Delft or also with other universities on a more international level? It is within the TU Delft, but also it's, uh, I mean, it's also we are trying mainly to kind of uh, be within the Netherlands at least because there are a lot of, uh, let's say, um, different, let's say, institutions that uh, they are specifically working on a certain topic, for example, the space, you know, um, and we can really benefit from the way that they are developing basically the kind of technologies and uh, these processes. So we are trying uh, to kind of establish that uh, network slowly. It takes yeah. time. <laughs> so now we are in November uh, 2021. No, 2020, 2020 only. <laughs> this will, this book, your the, the, the print of your research will arrive in about uh, a year or something. So what what will happen uh, uh, in, in the up upcoming months in, in, in your research? What, where will you go? Um, so indeed, we are working on this book. 
Um, this has been uh, something that uh, came out of interest uh, on our research at the university. So we realized that there was so much interest, and not only from the architectural industry, but uh, more broadly from designers and, and just people interested to, from, from this kind of idea of intuition, of impact of data. Uh, and then so we decided to uh, move on that research into a publication um, that will come out so in a year from now, uh, where we are uh, basically in contact with a series of writers. Uh, to bring some uh, knowledge and uh, theory uh, together into specific topics with this angle on uh, sustainability and uh, climate change. Uh, we are actually also going to uh, uh, document some of these locations with a photographer uh, where we are simply going to uh, open the curtain and unveil uh, some of the spaces that we've seen here and others that we will uh, unveil in the book. And, uh, of course, a selection of our research uh, that we've been uh, leading for over two years now uh, that will be uh, selected, curated, edited um, in the book. Um, and it's a kind of way for us to keep going the project. So whether it's a studio in a school, a publication, an exhibition, forms of lectures, seminars, uh, we're trying to explore uh, different formats to be able to connect with, uh, with different people to, to bring knowledge uh, coming from, from different angles. So this, this could be the follow-up to Countryside? It will. Aha! Very good, so we have a scoop here. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here, Paul and Nagar and uh, Federica and Philip uh, in Zoom. Uh, thank you all for watching us. Um, it has been an intriguing journey into the, 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 the world of, 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 of data and space and form and design and, uh, and also the computer itself. Uh, we will be back somewhere next year uh, with different topics, different architects. But for now, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for watching and also at home. If you like this uh, this edition, this live cast, please pay as you like because we definitely need it. Thank you very much.